So I'll stop sharing that now, Fantastic. Dean, and hand over to you. Uh, actually, Eleanor, I, I'm, I'm going to throw it right back at you if you don't mind. Uh, it'd be nice to get a little bit of a feel of uh, the Kerry biases and the Isle of Man biases before we go into my presentation. So maybe you've got a, a few things you can tell us about the Kerry biosphere. Yeah, absolutely. So the Kerry biosphere is obviously in Kerry. It's in the central area around the McGillicuddy Reeks. So we encompass Ireland's highest mountain, uh, Clarny National Park, which has our, one of Ireland's last native uh, herds of red deer. Um, it's a really beautiful place to live. For this webinar, we're not actually connected to the ocean. We're a landlocked biosphere, but I think it's really important to remember that no matter where you are in the world, you are connected to the ocean because I think it's over 50% of the oxygen that we breathe is created by phytoplankton in the surface waters of the ocean. So every second breath you take really relies on the ocean. So this webinar is relevant no matter where you are in the world. So I hope everyone enjoys it today. And if you get chance, definitely come and visit us here in Kerry. Fantastic. That's an interesting stat there, Eleanor. <laughs> um, now, do we have anyone from the Isle of Man, any of the advisory coordinators from the Isle of Man? I uh, I think we're actually missing Joe at the moment. I think she's dropped out. I know she was down um, out on the sound, so I think maybe her internet has given up on her for the moment. Uh, okay, so do you know what? We'll we'll crack on. If she comes back, we'll um, we'll get a few comments from her, and if if not now, then at the end certainly. So okay. okay. Da, 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 da. Oh, hang on, Bree. She is here. Um, she, let me just see if she, I can uh, I can add her as a, a panelist instead. Rishi nice works with that. the Isle of Man biosphere as well. I've just promoted her to panelists, so maybe she'll oh. drop in here now and be able to. Hi, Rishi. I'm not sure. Oh, yeah. Hi. So Hi. Oh, Sorry, that was Brishy. probably a bit of a surprise for you there to me. <laughs> make you jump on. <laughs> waiting because I thought Joe might struggle to get on um so yes I was I was there watching but I couldn't figure out how to get on as a panelist <laughs> no worries uh yeah and uh, I'll just say a few a bit about the Isle of Man biosphere and then we'll pass on to Dean um so yeah thank you Dean and hello from UNESCO biosphere Isle of Man uh like all biospheres we promote the conservation of and education about species and habitat uh, nearly nine tenths of our biosphere is sea, stretching out to our 12 mile limit. Uh, and visible from our 99 miles of coastline, we're blessed to have risos, bottlenose, and common dolphins, uh, minke whales, harbour porpoises, and the occasional rare visitor such as humpback and fin whales. Uh, Grey seals can be seen in abundance at a variety of locations, and common seals are also recorded in small numbers. Uh, and while not mammals, uh, the Isle of Man is also a great place to encounter basking sharks, which are regarded as the giants uh, of the sea, uh, the gentle giants of the sea, sorry. Um, and a bit like what you were saying there before, actually, um, you know, it's it probably the case that your sea life will be our sea life and vice versa. Uh, and it'll be really good to hear uh, Brian from Manx Whale and Dolphin Watch today during the presentation. Um, and yeah, hopefully we'll enjoy the webinar. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Brishi. Thanks very much for that introduction. And, um, you know, obviously the Isle of Man is a lovely place to visit. So uh, hopefully um, we'll be able to visit you guys in the not too distant future. So Thank moving you. on um, now. There we go. So my first slide here is um, of the Dublin Bay biosphere. You've got the River Liffey flowing down through uh, Dublin City um, and out into Dublin Bay. Um, you pretty much capture the whole of the biosphere in that picture you've got uh, on the left hand side, uh, Hoth Head um, to the fore of that North Line, which was the site of the original biosphere and then out to the right you've got uh, Dunleary and Dorky. Um, some of the sites that uh, a lot of the tourists don't get to see when they visit Dublin, uh, you know, they, they, they go to the, uh, the the typical tourist attractions enjoy a bit of trad life, um, but often they miss some of the better views. So we've uh, Collymore Harbour here on the top left, looking out to Dorky Island. Um, you've got Hoth Harbour um, and the, the the fishing village. There's a fishing boat coming in uh, on the bottom left hand side. You've the a bar stand in Dunleary, um, and then on the bottom right hand side you have a picture of North Mull Island. Um, and you know we're blessed to have so many wonderful sites on the doorstep of uh, a capital city. 
So uh, what is a biosphere? So they're interestingly recognized for their biodiversity value, but they're also actively managed for a balanced relationship between people and nature. I mean, that's the key. Um, you know, we want people to enjoy these places, um, but in the right way. So certainly there are some issues when you introduce people in nature um, and we try and actively manage that. Um, there are 714 biospheres uh, cited in 129 countries around the world. Um, and you will be listening to, to three of them today. Um, so what are the biosphere goals? <clears throat> so there's three primary goals. The first obviously is uh, conservation to protect what we have. Um, then it's also to uh, foster sustainable development. So those that work um, and live within those biospheres um, to help them operate in a sustainable manner. Um, and also learning. So the learning is um, studies by scientists, but it's also um, sharing that knowledge with um, the general public. And this, that's what this webinar is all about. So the Dublin Bay Biosphere's vision is to celebrate and promote a wider appreciation of the natural and culture, cultural heritage of Dublin Bay, to capture the inherent passion of the community for the biosphere concept, and for the Dublin Bay Biosphere being an exemplar for a new wave of biospheres in the world network. And we certainly hope that there'll be more biospheres here in Ireland um, in the future. Uh, Dublin Bay Biosphere will be recognised for its value as a place where people, nature and culture connect and where residents, visitors and businesses directly contribute to the conservation of their natural, cultural and built heritage through everyday actions. The Biosphere will support a strong local economy based on ecotourism and responsible recreation, where statutory NGO business, community and environment stakeholders work in partnership for a sustainable future. And partnership is a real key and it's um, partnership within the Dublin Bay Biosphere is really important. We have six partners that contribute towards the management of the biosphere, but it's also partnerships within the network. Um, and I just want to share with you something that we're going to be setting up or launching very soon. And this idea actually came from uh, the Isle of Man Biosphere. It's, uh, the, the Isle of Man Biosphere have a scout badge that they've been running for a number of years. And we thought that was a great idea and we'd like to do something similar. So we've set up a program with Scouting Ireland where we're in we're going to be working with young people and encourage them to connect with the biosphere. So we're going to get them to go out, enjoy the nature, use all their senses to experience what's around them, to learn about the processes that are going on and how people can be can uh, can have an impact, both positively and negatively, um, and also take an action to help protect the biosphere. That's something really exciting that's coming up in the not too distant future. So I'm going to move on. So I've got a short video from the Irish Whale and Dolphin Group, and I just need to come up for, to another slide here, um, make this full screen. Um, and this is an introduction to the Irish Whale and Dolphin Group. I hope you enjoy it. Welcome to the Irish Whale and Dolphin Group. Our mission is the conservation and better understanding of whales, dolphins and porpoises in Irish waters through study, education and interpretation. We coordinate all Ireland's stranding and sighting schemes to learn what species occur where and when. This helps us to develop conservation policies and strategies, but also to help people go out and see these magnificent creatures in Irish waters for themselves. We run our research vessel Celtic Mist for our members to sail on and learn how to identify and record whales, dolphins and porpoises in Ireland. Our local groups are made up of lots of different people with a shared passion for whales and dolphins in Ireland and the oceans. We run many long-term projects, including the Shannon Dolphins and Whale Track Ireland. Our work is also international. We have travelled to Iceland and Cabo Verde as we share whale populations with these island nations. Our consulting wing provides specialist services to inform management and industry and generates income to support our work. The island of Ireland is only 10% of the whole of Ireland. The other 90% is a marine environment and home to some of the most amazing marine wildlife in the world.
Well, thank you, Dean. Uh, I'm Simon Barrow. I'm CEO of the Irish Well and Dolphin Group. And thank you to Dean and Eleanor for inviting us to um, host this Marine Mammal webinar on, on Dublin. As you can see, um, it, it's just incredible the opportunities we have to experience whales and dolphins and other marine mammals and basking sharks and everything else that swims in our seas. So one of the missions of the group is to try and uh, encourage everybody to go out and experience it themselves and, and get connected to uh, to the marine wildlife. We're in our 30th year, so our 30th anniversary, so we've been around a long time and I suppose the cornerstone of the group is the coordination of all island stranding and sighting schemes, so that gives us uh, current information on where and when whales and dolphins are occurring and of course uh, when we feed this into the the website and to our members then hopefully it'll give people an opportunity to go and, and see them for themselves. So uh, I'm going to act as chair now for the next hour and uh, introduce all these brilliant people who have given us some of their time uh, this, this afternoon. Uh, I'll just briefly introduce um, whales and dolphins, uh, dolphins in Dublin Bay because we are privileged really to have such rich marine mammal um, abundance and diversity in, in the heart of our capital city. And I think in recent years, um, people in Dublin and Ireland are waking up to the, um, the uniqueness and obviously the Dublin Biosphere Project has been part of uh, creating awareness and interest. So uh, I think we're in a really good place and I think um, we're at the start of something really important in terms of um, connection with the sea. There's a lot of big important government um, initiatives from marine spatial planning to marine protected areas coming along the line. So the more the good people of Ireland and abroad appreciate what we have and have the desire to protect it, all the better. So I think most people's experience in marine mammals in and around Dublin is probably with the seals. Um, I'm not going to talk about seals with Kieran Dunn uh, talking specifically about uh, the seals on Ball Island. But just to remind people that, um, you know, we are surrounded by uh, protected sites for seals. Lambay Island is a very important protected site for um, grey and harbour seals. And it's estimated up to 300 seals in use in and around County Dublin. Um, so it's not just Bull Island. It's actually any really platform around uh, Dublin Bay you might find a seal hoard out on. Um, so, uh, you know, they're, um, they're very accessible and um, uh, amazing to watch. Just to give you some background, um, 25 different species of whales and dolphins have been recorded in Ireland. Um, the 25th species was in the 25th year of the Irish Whale and Dolphin Group, and actually um, it was off the East Coast, slightly north of County Louth, a bowhead whale turned up outside Carlingford Lock. Uh, bowheads are typically associated with the pack ice. There was no pack ice off Carlingford Lock when this bowhead turned up. So, you never know what's going to turn up. And I think uh, we should bear in mind that we are living in a, in a very changing world. So although we've been running a cycling scheme for 30 years, um, it doesn't mean that uh, what we knew 30, 20 or even 10 years ago um, is still relevant. Things are changing. So it's really important that we continue recording, continue sharing and continue mapping and understanding how whales and dolphins and other marine mammals use our waters. Not all these species are going to turn up in Dublin but uh, to date at least eight different species of whales and dolphins have been recorded off Dublin and another five species have stranded um, so we're probably offshore of Dublin so that's not a bad species count um, for, for the east coast of Ireland. Most of these sightings to the group are actually from land and we have a whole army of people watching from land, watching with good optics, um, watching in good sea conditions uh, and later Conal O'Flanagan, who's our, our stalwart on Hoth Head, uh, will be talking about some of his experiences. But you can see from this simple map that we have here that um, uh, they're very closer to shore. Blue is porpoise, green is dolphin and red is whale. So you can see that um, even, even in that simple map there, there's, there's maybe a, a, um, more likely to see a porpoise from Hoth Head than a dolphin, but maybe you're more likely to see dolphins down to the south around Dorky Island than, uh, than off Hoth Head. Um, the most um, frequently encountered species is the harbour porpoise, uh, what we call island's smallest whale, Mukamara, and you can see here that um, very much clustered around, around the shore. To be honest, they probably occur everywhere, but this reflects people's effort, people are where people are watching from. But I mean, they are very accessible, and if you go out in good sea conditions, you'll see, see harbour porpoises 
Um, Fiona Commons is going to talk a little bit about her work on porpoises in Dublin Bay. So we're at the start of understanding much, much more about porpoises um, uh, in Dublin and feeding into sort of conservation actions and policies. So we're, we're at the start of a good, really good, really good place, I think. These are bottlenose dolphins. Uh, um, we have bottlenose dolphins, common dolphins, wristless dolphins, a variety of uh, species. The bottlenose dolphins are probably the most likely uh, species you're going to see here, but they don't hang around. They're often highly mobile and moving. So um, uh, when they're around, enjoy them because they'll, they won't be around for long and maybe they'll be back a few months later. So you can see most dolphin sightings are, are more down to the south around Dunleary. Um, and here's a picture of a mink, uh, minke whale sightings, fewer sightings, um, and they're generally offshore. So you can see minke whales from shore. They're our smallest baleen whale. So all dolphins and porpoises have teeth, um, but uh, minke whales have baleen. But they're still eight meters long, so small is all relative. Uh, and they're, they're probably more widespread. Um, we just need more records. You generally have to be on a boat to see minke whales, but you can see them from shore. We also record strandings, and I won't go into strandings in any depth, but there's some interesting species washed up uh, around County Dublin, including a pygmy sperm whale there in 2013. We've never seen pygmy sperm whales alive in Irish waters. We only know them from maybe seven or eight strandings. So to get one washed up in Dublin alive was unprecedented and really, um, really unexpected. Now, the animal was in poor condition, so it didn't survive. But um, again, you never know what might turn up, so uh, be, be open-minded to what might turn up along the East Coast. So harbour porpoises, just a quick, um, obviously it's important for the whale and dolphin group if we want to record these, these species, is to encourage and support people's identification. Um, and we do that from, from training courses, we have publications, we have a book, we do videos. There's a whole range of resources on the website for people to look at and help and improve their identification skills. Um, but um, uh, the porpoise, although it's the most widespread and, and abundant species in Irish waters, it's actually one of the hardest to see. You really need, really need a calm sea to be able to see them. They're very elusive, they uh, avoid boats, um, they often only incur in small groups of one or two or three, so um, they are hard to see. But um, if you go at the right time, the right place, and you know what you're looking for, there's a really high chance of seeing harbour porpoises. The Mokamara Island's smallest whale. There's a, a new marine protected area for porpoises along the east coast from Rockerbill to Dorky Island. You can see here on the map. And whereas the area is quite small and really probably doesn't contribute hugely to protecting porpoises in that narrow box, what it has done is that there is no activity now really along the east coast, especially in and around Dublin Port, that doesn't take into account the potential impact on porpoises. So the, the SAC designation there really has focused people's minds on what is the impact of our activity on porpoises. So it's been very good in, um, in creating that awareness and developing mitigation, which um, Fiona might talk a small bit about. Bottlenose dolphins um, are the most, uh, most likely encountered dolphin off, off, um, off Dublin. They're big animals. Their distinguishing features is that there's nothing very distinguished about them. They're a big lump of grey animal. They don't have any uh, fancy patterns or any markings, um, but they're very active. They're very curious. They barroid vessels, um, so and they're very coastal. So when they are around, they're quite obvious because of their behaviour. Um, there's a picture there at the bottom there by Susan Early of um, dolphins off um, with the bailey in the background. And just the last few days, there's been so many sightings of bottlenose dolphins in and around Dublin. Um, uh, our sightings officer, Porrick, says that uh, as of yesterday, the sightings were coming in off Arklow. So it's likely that they have probably moved south. So they came to Dublin for a few days and then they headed off. But interestingly a lot, enough, those of you who remember, there was um, a couple of years here in 2010 and 2012 when three individual dolphins almost took a residency in around Dublin Bay and were seen um, throughout the year. Um, 186 sightings of these three animals, the Irish Red Dolphin Group recorded. And there's a fantastic picture there of, um, by John Coveney um, with the Martello Tower in the background. These animals, since they left Dublin in 2012, we've seen them since the Irish Red Dolphin Group recording schemes have picked up these very same individual dolphins off the West Coast. So they're alive and well. They just decided that it was time to leave Dublin. Um, and this was pre-COVID, so uh, what their motivation was, we don't know. Um, so uh, that was an unusual event, but um, certainly a lot of people had a lot of enjoyment uh, from those dolphins at the time. 
a dolphin that um, we, we, we were getting quite confident seeing this animal more to the south, um, kind of Dunleary, Wicklow, Greystones, is a Risso's dolphin. And we know very little about Risso's dolphins. Um, so they'd been turning up over in the spring, in the May period for a number of years. And we were just planning to maybe apply for some money and try and do some photo ID and do some work on these Risso's dolphins when they disappeared. And it's quite likely that these same individual dolphins uh, are also using the waters around the Isle of Man because they're, they're, they're again highly mobile. There's probably an Irish sea population, lots of work done off for the Isle of Man, uh, West Wales. Um, so we don't see them that often now, but um, uh, they, are, they were a species there that were quite characteristic of kind of South Dublin uh, back in the day. So minke whales are um, the most common baleen whale. You can see here that the dorsal fin, if you look at the picture on the left, the dorsal fin is not in the middle of the back, it's two thirds along the way of the back. So that's what distinguishes a dolphin from a whale. Um, if it's, uh, the dorsal fin's in the middle of the back, it's a dolphin. If it's towards the back end, it's a whale. Minky whales are characterized by that white patch. So the picture on the top right, you can see there's um, a white flipper patch on its pectoral here as it's uh, lunge feeding at the surface, and they have quite a triangular head. Um, but the really interesting thing about minke whales is there's no visible blow. So when you think of a large whale and this <laughs> exhalation and you see their breath, you really don't see it on a minke whale. Um, so it's quite characteristic. Any other large whale, you'd see a blow. Um, but minke whales in calm seas can be seen. Um, but again, they can be quite elusive for such a large animal. We do have more exotic species as well. Humpback whales are increasing in Ireland, um, certainly on the south coast, creeping up the west coast. But we are getting more sightings now off the north coast and the east coast. And here was a classic sighting 10 years ago now of a humpback whale that was hanging around Hoth Harbour. So um, I think going forward, we are more likely to see uh, more humpback whales off the east coast. Um, they are distinguished by the, their, they frequently raise their tail um, they fluke, as we call it. And to see a fluking whale, you know, is, a, is something you'll never forget. And I suppose it's become the uh, emblem of the environmental movement. So hopefully now in the next 10 years, 20 years, there'll be more humpback whales turning up off the East Coast. Um, so always expect these unexpected sites. Um, it's the time of year for basking sharks, and we, we often call them honorary whales and dolphins. Um, mainly because they're, they're reproduction, they're very, they're very um, long-lived animals, slow reproductive rates. So although they're fish, the second biggest fish in the world, um, we give them the title of honorary marine mammals. And the Irish Wren Dolphin Group um, collects sightings and feed it into this Irish basking shark group. And there's a lot of information online on the websites and on Facebook. And the sharks are turning up. They're turning up in huge numbers this last week uh, off the south coast. Um, they haven't pushed up the west coast yet or the east coast. But certainly calm weather, calm seas, um, basking sharks will start appearing off the east coast and um, uh, uh, just an unforgettable experience. So um, keep a look out now for the basking sharks. Um, I will stop sharing that now. So that's just a quick introduction to, um, to the whales of dolphins in Dublin Bay and, and, and we'll dig into this a little more deeply now. So I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Shebel Regan. Uh, Shebel is our education outreach officer based down here in Kilrush on the shores of the Shannon Estuary, which is a marine protected area for bottlenose dolphins. Um, so I'll hand it over to Shebel. Uh, thank you, Simon. And thanks everyone for uh, having me here today to talk about the Dublin Bay Biosphere. Um, I'm delighted. I'm just going to share this presentation quickly if it'll work. So today I'm just going to talk a little bit about the basic biology of marine mammals, uh, specifically whales and dolphins. And first of all, um, why are whales and dolphins mammals and not fish? This is a, a question that I actually get asked quite regularly. It's because they live in the water, you would um, think that they're fish and some people think that uh, whales and dolphins don't breathe air, but actually they're mammals just like you and me. So they do breathe air and they breathe air through a, a blowhole. They're also mammals because they give birth to live young and they suckle on milk. Um, and also whales and dolphins, especially when they're born, have these tiny little hairs on their skin. So that's all the characteristics of a mammal opposed to a fish that doesn't um, breathe air or rather they have gills to breathe underwater. And um, they have scales or uh, a kind of mucous membrane around the outside of them. And they also lay eggs. 
So that's just a little bit. Why are um, marine mammals actually mammals, even though they live under the water? So they're mammals just like you and me, but it's kind of same, same, but different. So even though we're all mammals, whales and dolphins are, are very different. Their body shape is different. The way they move is different. Um, for example, this helps them swim a lot better. So um, by developing different um, body shapes in a more streamlined way, they can propel themselves through the water. And seals do this um, by alternating horizontal sweeps of their back flippers, um, while whales and dolphins have developed a tail fluke that helps them propel forward. So I have a little gift there that shows they propel themselves forward. And this is why also whales and dolphins can't uh, swim backwards so they can't move their head around fully um, because they have fused vertebrates. So they're also different because they have certain adaptions that help them um, dive and hold their breath for longer. So whales and dolphins can, uh, especially deep diving ones, can collapse their rib cage, um, allowing the, the thorax to shrink shrink and this uh, helps them cope with pressures um, as well so their, their lungs kind of shrink up and then um, it, there's more room for everything. They also have more myoglobin and hemoglobin which helps um, retain oxygen for longer so they don't have they can dive for deeper and longer and they don't have to take as many breaths um, at the air. So this is really a really cool um, difference between with marine mammals and then humans or terrestrial mammals. Um, so that's a little bit about the biology of whales and dolphins. But because this is the Dublin Bay biosphere, I also wanted to talk a little bit about Ireland's smallest cetacean and Simon mentioned them briefly there. Um, and I think Fiona is going to talk about them again more in detail, but this is the harbour porpoise. So harbour porpoises live life in the fast lane. And normally whales and dolphins, they're large, they live for a long period of time, but not the harbour porpoise. So the harbour porpoise is relatively small, it's about 1.5 metres, and they reach sexual maturity in and around age three. So this is different to, let's say, bottlenose dolphins, which Simon spoke a little bit about earlier as well, which reach sexual maturity around six to 13 years. So that's, that's quite a difference. And research done by um, Andrew Reid suggests as well that um, harbour porpoises can have a calf every year um, after they reach sexual maturity. And they can often simultaneously be pregnant and lactating at the same time. So they're really living in the fast lane. They're, they're getting, um, they're reproducing loads, they eat loads, and they need to squish a lot in because the average lifespan of a harbour porpoise is about nine to 10 years. Um, of course, the oldest individual was recorded as 24 years off the Californian coast. But um, that's a very interesting little more details about harbour porpoise for you. Um, now, I think that's kind of all I had time for. Um, but I look forward to any questions about the biology of whales and dolphins. Again, um, they are mammals. They're very similar to us, um, but they are same, same, but different. They have loads of adaptions to help them live under the water. And now I'm going to share a video of um, Conal, or I think actually Dean is going to share it, talking about local groups in Dublin. So this will um, inform everybody if, if they're in the Dublin area, how they can get involved with the Irish Well and Dolphin Group. But of course, there's lots of international people joining us today, which is brilliant to see. And to if you want to learn more about the group and, and stay up to date, um, the Irish Island Dolphin Group do have an online e-zine that you can register um, for free um, on our website and then we're also on all of the, the social media. But we'll uh, hand it over now to Kuno. Hello, I'm Conal O'Flanagan and I'm the coordinator of the Dublin local group of the IWDG. We're here in Holt Head where I do most of my watching. Holt Head is a, a wonderful area and uh, you'd be very unlucky if you weren't, didn't see something on most visits. Harbour porpoises are the staple diet for Holt and indeed most of the Dublin area. Uh, the, the waters off Dublin from Rockabill down to Dockey Island are 
a special area of con conservation for harbour for offices. So uh, it's no surprise that we see them. And it is great that we can keep an eye on the numbers. They're here all year round. So we can see whether the numbers fluctuate during the year or whether numbers at any given time are the same as in previous years. And thankfully, numbers have seemed to have held up, which is great. As well as the harbour corpses, we can see minke whales. And only a few months ago, there were a group of five or six minke whales just offshore. Very occasionally, there have been bottlenose dolphins in Dublin Bay. Uh, I have never seen them from here. Uh, the last dolphin I saw in this area was actually a very sick common dolphin up in Malahide. Uh, we had a fin whale a number of years ago in very poor condition. It was seen on the uh, Dublin Bay side of, of Holt Peninsula. I think the message to people who should join the group is that it is a very very pleasant way of contributing to science. The, it's the accumulation of small little pieces of information Sometimes people don't appreciate how important these things are, but if, if all these little bits of information, sighting here, a sighting there, a, a stranding here, a stranding there, might not seem significant individually, but if, if people record them all, if results are aggregated, it can make a huge contribution to conservation efforts. Thanks um, for that, Connell. Connell is actually one of our longest members uh, of the Irish Wendolf group. He was very active uh, at the very start of the group in 1995. Um, he, he, his activity kind of uh, dropped a bit when he went off to raise a family, which we let him off. But um, he's now more active than ever. Now he's retired and he's actually one of our directors. He's secretary of the board of directors. And as Chabelle said, has been uh, very instrumental in, in trying to set up a, a local group in Dublin. So uh, it'd be great to hear of some of Connell's experiences of North County Dublin. Connell. Muted, Connell. Connell, you're muted. Thank you, Simon. Am I loud and clear now? Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, it's great to be here and um, it's lovely to think that there's so many people interested in whales and dolphins in the Dublin area. Yeah, I've had, a, I must say, a great time over the last 30 years or so, give or take a break in the middle, watching the uh, cetaceans in the Dublin area. Um, I mentioned Holt, but I'd hate people to think that there's nowhere other than Holt that you can watch for porpoises. Uh, you saw earlier the map of the... Um, the SAC, which ran all the way from Rockabill down to Dorky. Well, really, all along the adjacent coast, you can look out for porpoises. And over the years, I, I've done that. Um, some of the best places are Red Island off Skerries, Loch Shinny, Rush, the cliff path between Port Ran and um, Dunna Bays, and even the, the, the road from Malahai to Port Marnock. I've seen porpoises from all of those places. Um, and then moving south of Holt, there's Dorky Island, there's the Vicor Road in, in Killiney, and on down towards Bray. So really, you can, you can see these wonderful animals anywhere from the coast. Perhaps the most important thing is to pick a good day. I'd love to be able to tell people to rush out today and go looking for them. But unfortunately, we have a strong easterly wind here on the east coast. What that does is it lumps up the sea and makes porpoises, because they're so small, very difficult to see. So if you do want to go out and have a, a search for porpoises or indeed anything else, and as Simon said earlier on, there's quite a few other things do turn up and have turned up in the last few days. Pick a calm day. That's a day with very little wind. Preferably what wind there is should be from the, from the west, which, as Anybody who's done geography will know that's the prevailing wind. So we do live in a good place uh, on the East Coast. Um, I just go out to Holt maybe once or twice uh, a, a week at most. But I know there's one guy who goes out nearly every second day and he sends in reports uh, of his sightings. He's also in Holt. I've uh, never met this guy, Dave O'Connor. Perhaps he's listening in. If he is, hello, Dave. Um, I'll get to meet you sometime. But all these records build up over time. And indeed, going back to the SAC, um, you know, 
that was fine lies as a result of surveys that were done by professional marine biologists, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But people like me and Dave, and maybe more people who might join us, who just go out, see something, report it, and all those records eventually contribute to the type of decision making that leads to the establishment of an SAC. So um, I would encourage everybody to get out to their nearest stretch of coast. If, if that happens to be Holt, or even if it isn't, um, and you happen to see somebody strolling around looking out to sea, it might be me. Feel free to tap me on the shoulder and we'll have a chat. Um, on a more formal basis, we have set up a, a Dublin group of the IWDG. We were established finally in December of last year. We've been in lockdown more or less since, so we, we haven't met. WhatsApp is great, but uh, none of us have actually met yet. We're hoping to do that uh, uh, maybe next month. so. And it would be great if we had more people to join us. And the way to go about that is, of course, to log into iwdg.ie. Um, and there's some great information there, including lots of details about porpoises, minke whales, bottlenose dolphins, common dolphins, etc., that turn up off our coast, um, and maybe join the IWDG as well. But whether you opt to join or not, if you do see something, please report it. Please report it on our website. Uh, you might think it amounts to much, but every as I say, every mickle makes a muckle. Every record counts. Um, and that's really me. Um, so maybe I'll see you out on, on the, the coast sometime over the next few weeks. Thank you very much. Thanks, Connell. Um, it's interesting because um, you said about you haven't seen common dolphins from Hoth Head. You know, I, I would typically expect common dolphins in the sort of Irish Sea coming up from the south in kind of late summer and autumn. So it was interesting just two days ago. We've got a um, video of common dolphins off the Keith Bank, and then yesterday uh, videos of um, possibly the same common dolphins travelling from Lambay Island down towards Dublin Bay. So maybe we missed common dolphins in the past. Maybe something has changed to make them occur earlier in the year. Uh, it's hard to know, but that continuous monitoring and watching and recording um, will hopefully detect these changes that we are experiencing, because we all know we're living in unprecedented times. So thanks, Connell. I'd like to introduce Fiona uh, now. Um, when we were asked to host this um, or, or be involved in this um, webinar, it, it seemed a, a fantastic opportunity to, um, to, to introduce Fiona and her work um, because she's really started out on, on hopefully a journey that will really improve our knowledge about harbour porpoises in Dublin Bay. So Fiona is an active member of the Irish Wren Dolphin Group. She's been involved in a lot of our work inshore and offshore. Um, some of our consultancy work as well, and uh, recently graduated from uh, GMIT in Galway with a master's. So she just started a PhD at uh, GMIT um, on the porpoises in Dublin Bay, funded by Dublin Port, and central to her work will be the use of acoustics. So um, we'd love to hear uh, uh, Fiona's introduction to acoustics, because when you're thinking of whales and dolphins and porpoises, you need to think acoustics. So over to you, Fiona. Thanks, Simon, for that. Um, let me just open it up. Um, so after listening to Connell there, I'm more eager than ever to get out to the coast myself and do some watching. Unfortunately, I'm in landlocked County Monaghan here, so I have a, a little while to wait yet. But uh, so as Simon said, I'm doing a PhD in GMIT Galway and for my presentation now I'm going to uh, move away from talking about watching uh, marine mammals from land and introduce you to how we can listen to porpoise by tapping into their acoustics. So... No, this isn't going to the next one, unfortunately. Um, let's see. I'll stop sharing for a moment. I'll try again.
There we go. So why would we use acoustics to study hybrid porpoise? Um, so as we've heard already, um, they are considered a very shy species and actively move away from boats, for example. Um, and um, if the water is in any way choppy, it can be really hard to see them. Uh, adding to this, they uh, only spend about 5% of their time at the surface of the water. So even if they're present in an area, it can be hard to see them from land. Um, however, they make up for this by being very acoustically active. So uh, harbour porpoise, like many cetaceans, they use aspects for pretty much every aspect of their lives, for uh, navigating, for catching fish, for socialising and communicating, and it's been shown that they're almost continuously acoustically active. Um, so what sound is it that the harbour porpoise actually makes? What does the porpoise say? So I mean, humans hear between 20 and 20,000 hertz, uh, and anything below this is, um, any frequencies below this are called infrasonic, and any frequencies above this are called ultrasonic, and this is where the hybrid porpoise um, falls. So it produces what we call clicks between 110 and 150,000 hertz, uh, and hybrid porpoise along with 12 other species are categorized as narrowband high frequency. So this means that they're producing sounds at this really high frequency, but only um, within a small range of frequencies. So if we compare that to a bottlenose dolphin, um, they use frequencies between 200 hertz and 150,000 hertz, so much broader range of frequencies. Um, so they harbor porpoise use their clicks for echolocation. It's very similar to um, how bats echolocate. So they produce a click, which is the sound produced in their melon, which is in the bulbous part of their head. Uh, and this click is then reflected off objects in the environment, so fish or rocks, um, for example. And they then detect this reflected sound in their lower jaw. And they can tell how far the object is, how large it is, for example. Um, so that's how they do that. Uh, so the bottomless dolphin as well, they have this broad range of frequencies and they use the lower frequencies for whistles and for communicating and stuff and the higher frequencies for echolocating. And it was thought that perhaps hyperporpus don't communicate or socialize as much acoustically as um, bottomless dolphins, for example. However, it's been shown now that they actually spend quite a bit of time communicating with um, fellow porpoise and they alter their interclick interval. So this is the time between clicks to achieve a different acoustic behaviors. Um, so harbor porpoise and the other narrowband high frequency species likely evolved this way of vocalizing to avoid being detected by predator species such as killer whales or similar species that are now extinct. Um, because killer whales are most sensitive to frequencies between 5,000 and 81,000 uh, 81, uh, hertz. And they're much less sensitive at the high frequencies that we're uh, vocalize at. So here we have a pretty classic example of a harbor porpoise click train. Um, I think we heard this earlier already. Harbor porpoise spend a lot of time foraging and eating because they have very high metabolism. And as Cheval said, they live their life in the fast lane. So in the top graph, we can see here, um, we have the frequency. So it's this really narrow band between 120 and 140,000 hertz, that classic narrow band high frequency. And in the bottom graph, we have the interclick interval, so the time between clicks. And at the beginning of the click train, you can see that um, the clicks are between 20 and 30 milliseconds, the time between them. And as the click train progresses, the time between clicks gets smaller and smaller up until it's like about four milliseconds. So this is the point of attempted prey capture. Um, so how do we collect acoustic data? So we use underwater microphones called hydrophones. And um, there's two kind of main setups for this. You can use a toad array um, or statically deployed acoustic equipment in the water column. So a toad array involves basically a long cable that has the hydrophones in it. 
being told behind a boat, and this is usually done in um, conjunction with a visual boat-based survey as well. And then what we have in Dublin Bay uh, is that you deploy equipment that stays in the water column for an extended period of, period of time. This can be deployed from permanent structures like jetties or from purposely deployed buoys, as we can see here in the diagram. <clears throat> So in Dublin Bay, we have sea pots from Chelonia Limited, and these can be deployed in Dublin for, for quite a few years now. And they collect digital data about detected cetacean quick trains. Um, and in Dublin, as we know, harbour porpoises are present year round, and on 100% of days that the sea pots have been out there, um, harbour porpoises are detected. So they're very active in the area. I'm going to talk a bit now how this type of acoustic data can be used for research and for conservation. So we can bring, so we need three kind of main aspects, the biological data, which is this acoustic data telling us about harbour porpoise presence and activity. And we bring it together with environmental variables such as the time of day and depth, tides, season, um, and then human activities, for example, vessel traffic and dredging all together and models inform us on what is driving harbour porpoise activity and presence in the bay, why they might as and it can also inform us on how human activity might be affecting them, particularly in a busy area like Dublin Bay. And this can inform future management plans. So it can inform management plans for Dublin Port for the special area of conservation. Um, and as Simon was saying there's lots of marine language of the species. Listening and I'm also happy to any questions. Lovely, thanks Fiona. We just as your bandwidth is just hanging in there. Um, so we'll, we'll leave the questions to the end. Uh, Dean's going to host the questions and answers. Um, so thanks very much for that. And thanks to Dublin Port for, for their support as well. Um, I'll move on now, Fiona. We'll come back to you to, at the end. Uh, move on to, to Kieran Dunn. Obviously, uh, we couldn't have a webinar on marine mammals in Dublin Bay without um, including seals. And uh, Kieran has been studying seals with the North Bull Seal Study Group, him and Tom Cooney, for about a decade now. And uh, just last year, they published a really interesting uh, paper in the Irish Naturalist Journal on some of their findings. Um, so it was, uh, it's uh, fascinating and we're delighted that Kieran could join us. Um, Kieran uh, is um, an active member of the Irish Wildlife Trust, Birdwatch Island and the Irish Well and Dolphin Group. So he's has many interests, uh, but today he's going to share some of his experiences on the seals of North Bull Island. Kieran, up to you. Thank you, Simon. I'm, I'm my, hi, my name is Kieran Dunn. I'm a member of the North Bull Island Seal Study Group, and I'm going to talk today about the seals of the North Bull Island. So the hollow site is located on the sandbank between Holt and the Bull Island. It is surrounded by the waters at Sutton Creek. Two species of seal are found at the site, harbour seals, which are also called common seals, and grey seals. These seals are relative newcomers to the National Nature Reserve. We reckon the, the site was established approximately 10 to 20 years ago. So it is a 21st century phenomenon. How many seals are present? Well, last July we had 40 seals. The number of seals present is dependent on the tides, the seasons, and the, the level of disturbance in the area. Are the seals resident or seasonal? Well, the harbour seals are resident. They're present throughout the year whereas the grey seals are seasonal, they're present during the summer. Berting, the harbour seals are regular breeders at the site, whereas we've no evidence 
of the gray seals having bred on the island. Identification of the seals is based on three features, head profile, body appearance, and behavior. The head profile is arguably the most diagnostic marker for distinguishing between the two species. Harbor seals have a distinctive forehead. They have a dip on the bridge of their nose. In contrast, gray seals have a straight or Roman profile when viewed from the side. They have no dip in their forehead. Their forehead is flat. Gray seals also have a longer, narrower face or nozzle. In contrast, harbor seals have a smaller, rounded face. They have a broader, flatter face, so the distance between the eyes and the nose or snout is smaller. Gray seals are larger. They're up to 2.5 meters in size. They're generally darker in color. They, they appear black when wet, but they're generally gray, blue gray, or brown gray in color. They have larger, blotchier markings. In contrast, the harbor seals are smaller. They're up to 1.85 meters in length. They're generally brighter and more mottled in appearance. The spots are gray or brown in color. Behavior is particularly significant when both species are present during the summer. The gray seals are located close to the water's edge. They're bunched together, clumped almost on top of one another. They're more aggressive, especially the males. They're more restless, they're seldom still. They're more skittish, they're more nervous and sensitive of threats and disturbances in the area. In contrast, the harbor seals are usually five to 10 feet further back from the water's edge. They're often in the background or the periphery of the gray seal colony. Harbor seals are more territorial. They're approximately one meter apart. They're more relaxed, so they're easier to study and photograph. They're more agile. They shuffle at speed on the sand using their bellies. In contrast, gray seals are larger, more portly, and therefore more cumbersome on the sand. Both species exhibit a bottling out impression, whereby the head and neck protrude above water surface when feeding at Sutton Creek. Photo identification is used to establish site fidelity by individual seals. Harbor seals have unique forehead markings called pelage, which don't change over time. In contrast, gray seals do not have these distinctive pelage markings. So apart from one female with an obvious abrasion scar, identification of individual seals was too difficult. In the bottom left here, we have a, a, a female gray seal with a, a, an abrasion scar. That was probably caused by an entanglement with a net or, or a wire. Berting. In autumn, female harbor seals with pups have provided evidence that this is a regular breeding site for harbor seals. No gray seal pups have been recorded at this site. In the bottom left, we have a photograph of a harbor seal, female, with a baby in the foreground, whitish. We conducted a four year study from 2014 to 2017, and that was published in the Irish Naturalist Journal in 2020, in March, volume 37. And Tom has kindly su summarized the si sightings and findings in, in that study into two bar charts. As you can see, the highlighted region here is in orange, and it's the general birthing period. For harbor seals, that birthing period is in midsummer, June and July, whereas for gray seals is later in the year, October, November. The, the molt period for gray seals runs from December to April. Gray seals are generally absent from the island at this time. Gray seals are seasonal on the island. 
we have a peak of about 20 to 30 individuals in July and August. We had 32 grey seals there last July. We've no evidence of grey seals having bred on the island. In contrast, harbour seals are resident on the island. They're present from January right through to December. The monthly average is approximately eight individuals. Since the 2017 study, we should also state that from 2018, that we had a winter population of harbour seals of approximately 20 individuals. And in February of this year, we had 25 harbour seals. That would suggest that there's a resident population of approximately eight harbour seals throughout the year and a winter population of 20 to 25 harbour seals. And together with the summer population of 25 to 30 grey seals, that the island is currently used by approximately 50 plus seals during the year. So how do we help protect the seals? Well, we would recommend observing the seals from a safe distance using optics like binoculars, a telescope, zoom lenses. We wouldn't encourage people to go onto the sandbank. We would strongly, strongly recommend that you never bring dogs near the seal hall outside. And we would also advocate that water sports are not performed near the hall outside. To finish, I'd just like to mention one or two things here. We've got the, the two biodiversity web websites, one for birds and one for seal sightings. Read the paper that Simon mentioned in Irish Naturalist Journal. It was published last year in 2020, volume 37. I would like to thank Tom for his support with this presentation and for superb photographs. And then one last thing, I would just like to mention that I propose to host a seal watching outing in Southern Promenade next Friday week on the 30th of April at 11.30. And you may well ask, where is Southern Promenade? Southern Promenade is about 200 metres beyond Santa Sabina School. You, take, you walk about 50 metres beyond the school and you take a sharp turn to your right and you walk up the coast road for 150 metres. Um, I'll be there on a grassy verge just before the promenade in a red high Hyundai. So you're all welcome to join us. Um, that's Friday week, 30th of April, 11.30, Sutton Promenade. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thanks, Kieran. Thanks for taking the time out to share all your knowledge. Uh, I think it's great work that you and Tom have been doing. Um, we'll save questions the, to the end. I'm sure there's plenty of questions. Uh, it's interesting to know that the uh, Dublin City Council are, are revising their biodiversity action plan. So hopefully there's an opportunity there to, to, to bring in something uh, to do with the seals and try and uh, minimize disturbance and, and encourage encourage what you said is, is a new, new uh, feature of, of the Dublin biosphere. Okay, our last kind of formal, formal talk, if you like, is um, from Bryony. Manly uh, from the Isle of Man. I'm delighted she can join us um, to tie in uh, to the other biospheres. We couldn't quite uh, get the landlocked Kerry biosphere to uh, to contribute to the marine mammal debate, but uh, Bryony is um, is representing uh, outside of Dublin, so um, it's great to have you join us. Bryony is a marine scientist and researcher with the Manx Whale and Dolphin Watch. She first came to the Isle of Man in 2003 uh, to work on her master's program and loved it so much that she returned permanently in 2017 to continue the research of the charity. I know they've just published a paper, her, her, herself and Tom Belch, bringing together all the work and the sightings of the uh, Maxwell and Dolphin Watch. So uh, thanks very much, Bryony, and I uh, look forward to hearing all about uh, the biosphere across the Irish Sea. Thank you. Okay. So thank you, Simon. Uh, and I'm going to jump straight into talking about the cetaceans of the Isle of Man. So, oh, there we go. Um, just so you know where we all are, um, hopefully you know where the Isle of Man is. <laughs> That's us right in the middle of the Irish Sea there. Um, not too far from 
you guys in Dublin Bay, about 110 kilometers. Um, but we're only a small island with about 160 kilometers of coastline. Um, and that red line there is our territorial waters around the Isle of Man. And generally our waters are very shallow. So hopefully you can see there with the lines, the whole region around the island is um, generally less than 50 meters deep. Um, and just around the south there, it gets between 50 and 100 meters. And just off the west um, is around about uh, um, 100 meters deep. So generally the whole waters are very shallow. Uh, this is us here, um, Manxville and Dolphin Watch. Uh, we're a small voluntary organisation um, and we're the only organisation in the Isle of Man studying cetaceans. Uh, we've been operating since about 2007 um, and Tom on the right of the picture there has been involved since the beginning and Jen and I got involved later on around 2012-13. Um, Jen focuses more on the education and outreach, and I do more of the data and research side of things. And we do land-based surveys, boat-based surveys, um, and we collect sightings from members of the public, which is very important to add to our data set. Um, and all of this can help tell us about the distribution and seasonality, so the when and where of um, what we see around the island. Um, just briefly mention, like I said, we study the cetaceans, so that's whales, dolphins, and porpoises. Uh, the Manx Wildlife Trust study the stranded cetaceans um, and, and take records of those. And they also monitor the grey seals, which breed around the Isle of Man. And then there's a charity called Manx Basking Shark Watch, which um, record the basking shark sightings, which many people know from around the island. So I'm going to talk about our Manx Marine Big Five, the main five species which we see here. Um, and thankfully, all the other lovely presentations from Ireland have kind of already introduced these species, so I can just jump straight into telling you about when and where we see them. Uh, so just briefly, this is um, where we where we study. So all around the island, our boat-based tracks all around the Isle of Man, we get out whenever the weather's good enough, which isn't as often as we'd like. But, um, and then uh, try and cover as much of the territorial waters of the island as possible. And then on the right, we have our dedicated land-based uh, stations, which are mostly in the southern part of the island. Um, along the northwest coast, it's very flat, so you don't get much um, height above sea level, so it's not great for, for surveying from there. But these are our dedicated sites around the south. So the harbour porpoise, which we've um, encountered before from Dublin Bay, um, our smallest cetacean and the resident um, species that we have here all year round. So you can see we see them in all seasons of the year all around the island um, in all of Max waters. So we tend to say to people if you keep your eyes peeled on a lovely calm day then there's a good chance you'll spot a porpoise anywhere in Max waters. Uh, common dolphin, which despite the name is not our most commonly seen dolphin species, um, we get a few sightings through throughout the spring and the autumn, mostly through the summer months. Um, many of the sightings we get are from a few miles offshore, from boaters or, or fishermen. Um, we do sometimes see them from land around the south of the island, um, but typically they're a little bit further offshore, so not as easy to spot from land. And, and we see them in, in smallish pods up to maybe 20 or 30. Uh, the bottlenose dolphin, the classic dolphin that everyone thinks of. Um, I think most people usually imagine dolphins are going to be a summer thing um, and you know they think of good weather and seeing dolphins but our bottlenose dolphins are actually winter visitors. So typically October to March is when we expect to see big pods of bottlenose and you can see we see them really close in along the east coast um, and we can get very large pods of bottlenose um, up to 100, sometimes even more. Um, and from photo identification, we know that some of these dolphins are part of the, um, the population which spend the summers in Cardigan Bay in Wales. Um, and some of the dolphins are not recognised from Cardigan Bay. So we think this is an important area for dolphins from probably around the Irish Sea um, are coming into Manx waters in the winter and mixing with other dolphins. Um, and it's, you can see from the photos here how close they come into land. So it's 
fantastic to see huge pods of dolphins along the coast in the winter months. So I'm just going to briefly mention um, a really interesting um, thing we've got going on in the island at the moment with a resident mother dolphin. Um, so Moonlight is a bottlenose dolphin from the Murray Firth population. The Murray Firth population has been studied since the 90s um, and I think Moonlight was first seen in 1997. Um, in March 2019, a group of bottlenose um, left the Murray Firth and were sighted at, at Northern Scotland. Um, and then they seemed to break off into little subgroups and a few were seen around Ireland. Um, and the reason they weren't spotted was because of this very recognisable dolphin called Spurtle that was sunburned, I believe. Um, so it has this very obvious white marking. Um, and some of the group even made it as far as the Netherlands in July 2019. Quite a few of the group have in fact gone back to the Moray Firth since, but Moonlight is hanging around the Isle of Man. So she was first spotted in the south of the island in September 2019. She was videoed very close to shore with an extremely small calf, which we think was probably days, if not hours old. Um, and since then, they have been seen um, exclusively around the Isle of Man, um, predominantly the west coast, Peel Bay, um, where we're based with Maxwell and Dolphin Watch, and coming right into the bay in really shallow waters to feed. Um, and they've been seen so regularly by so many people, which uh, over the last year or so that we've all had, is that was um, such a joy for people to watch them coming in really close to shore. And we had a little competition on the island and the Manx public chose to name the calf Starlight. So we have Moonlight and Starlight hanging around the island and they're still here. They were last seen yesterday. So keep an eye out if you're from the Isle of Man and you might spot them. And then my favorite species, probably the Risso's dolphin. Um, as they were mentioned in, in the other presentations, um, a really, really interesting species that we don't know a lot about. And there are very few places around the British Isles where you can actually see them easily and see them from land. Um, we're very lucky on the Isle of Man to be one of those places. Um, so these guys are here at the opposite time of year to bottlenose dolphins. Um, so from March to October, typically. Um, they start to come in in spring and usually the first place we see them is from um, Marine Drive along the east coast of uh, near Douglas, if anyone's from the island. Um, and then through the summer, all around the south of the island, particularly from the southern end of around the Sound, it's a great place to see them. Um, and then they slowly start to disappear in the autumn. And we, we very rarely um, get records of them in the winter. A few public sightings get reported um, over the years, but you know, this is 12 over our whole study period. So, so probably not considered here in the winter. Um, from photo identification, we know that some of the same animals are returning here year after year. And we see some of them with calves. So this picture at the bottom here is a very cute Teresa's dolphin calf. So the um, Manx waters seem to be really important for them. Um, and that's interesting because that such shallow waters that we have here, and Rissos are considered more of a deep diving species where they dive to hunt um, squid and octopus and cuttlefish, which is their prey species. So it's really interesting to have them um, so close into the island. And um, our resident, well, our regular whale species um, is the minke whale. So we start to get sightings of those guys in the springtime. Um, and then in the summer, we, we often see them quite a lot th uh, around the west coast and around to the south. Um, and then in the autumn, they move up almost exclusively close into the east coast. Um, and we believe this is for them to feed on the spawning herring, which spawn all along the east coast of the Isle of Man in the autumn. So again, you can see the picture here. They're coming incredibly close to shore. People can see them from the coast and hear them even see them without binoculars sometimes when they're really close in feeding. So it's a, um, a fantastic place to be able to spot them at that time of year. Um, and they're, they're often um, referred to as herring hogs because they eat so much herring. So. 
Uh, I'll just briefly mention some of the other species that we know of. So in the top right here, we have the humpback whale. So these are pictures from Manx waters. So we've had a couple of confirmed sightings of the humpback whale, um, maybe 10 or so of, over our whole study period. Um, the bottom two pictures here, unfortunately not pictures from the Isle of Man, but these are fin whales. Um, we believe we've seen fin whales from um, from the east coast when watching the minkies feeding. You can see big whales much further offshore. And if you remember, it was mentioned earlier that minky whales don't blow. So if you spot a large whale producing a large blow, then it's almost certainly something else. So perhaps a fin whale, or it perhaps could have been a say whale. So this top one in the middle here is a say whale which stranded on the island in the 20s. Um, and the skeleton of this is now in the Manx Museum. Um, in the middle here, we have um, a pilot well, which stranded last year. Uh, the first record, I believe, of this species on the Isle of Man. Um, at the bottom there, a striped dolphin, which stranded a couple of years back. Um, again, I think the first record of this from the island. Um, and then again, bottom left, not a Manx picture, unfortunately, <laughs> killer whale. Um, it's possible that killer whales pass through Manx waters every now and then. We have people telling stories of it from the past. Um, more recently, we do still get mention of them, but often the sightings that get reported to us turn out to be Risso's dolphins, um, which we confirm through photographs and other things. So for a small, um, a small island and a small coastline, we have a great, great selection of cetaceans to see all year round. So thank you very much. Thank you, Bryony. That's great. So you can see so much commonalities between uh, Dublin and um, the Isle of Man. And uh, I've no doubt that we not only share species, but we share individuals. And it's uh, by working together, we can um, tell these stories. That's a great story about moonlight and starlight. I wasn't aware yeah. of that. So, uh, so that's brilliant. Um, so I'm just going to ask Dean now to show uh, a short video on bottomless dolphins. You know, it's all right talking about them, but it's much nicer seeing them. So the Wendell Dolphin do produce kind of videos to um, to help people identify, but also to learn about um, the different species. So given that the bottlenose dolphins have been frequenting Dublin Bay the last couple of days, we thought we'd show you this uh, short video on uh, a bit about bottlenose dolphins. Thanks, Dean. Hello, everyone. Welcome to National Biodiversity Week with the Irish Whale and Dolphin Group, where we are celebrating the wonderful marine mammal biodiversity of Ireland. Bottlenose dolphins have been recorded year-round all around the Irish coast, but a few great places to see them include the Shannon Estuary, Donegal, Mayo and Galway. These are a large, robust dolphin with a characteristically short, stubby beak and a curved dorsal fin. They are a very active and acrobatic species and can be regularly seen breaching, tail slapping and bow riding boats. Bottlenose dolphins can be found in both inshore and offshore waters of temperate and tropical regions throughout the Pacific, Indian and Atlantic Oceans. Here in Ireland, we are home to three separate populations, including a resident population in the Shannon Estuary, an inshore population and an offshore population. that uh, finish a little bit prematurely there and I think some of you struggle a bit with the sound there but uh, thanks for that. Um, okay I'm going to wrap now I'm just going to show um, one last slide and um, just out of respect of our bottlenose dolphins and um, so as uh, some of you realize now there's um, uh, this lovely photograph taken just uh, three days ago by Sarah Coban of uh, a group of bottlenose dolphins at Stork Island in the background and then um, uh, Heather took a picture of the same group, probably right in front of the uh, Paul Begg Lighthouse. And as of uh, yesterday, I think this group have probably moved down to, to Arklow. But what's really interesting is we can follow uh, bottlenose dolphins from sightings coming in from the public. Um, if the group size, the behaviour, the distance travelled per day is um, consistent, then we can 
often track the same group. We've tracked them all the way down from Northern Ireland, from County Antrim, all the way down the East Coast as far as Wicklow. Um, we can also track individuals. So this is a picture of the dorsal fin of a botanist dolphin, and you can see it's quite well marked. It's got notches and nicks, which are permanent and are specific to that individual. So it becomes not just a dolphin, but an individual dolphin, and we can give it numbers and we can give it names, but also we can follow uh, that dolphin as it travels around. And uh, people these days have got such good cameras uh, that they can get fantastic photographs, uh, even from their phone, that we can recognize individual dolphins. So as said in the video, um, we now know that we have three populations of, of bottomless dolphins. Um, this was worked out genetically um, using skin samples from stranded animals. He's a stranded bottomless dolphin and also biopsy samples. These are when we fire a small arrow or a dart into the dolphin to get a, a skin sample that we can use for genetics and other studies. So uh, in Ireland, we have a small resident population, the Shannon Estuary. We have a, um, a, a probably a, a relatively small, maybe 200, 300 animals uh, in what we call our coastal population. And uh, we have an offshore population which numbers in its thousands and roams from waters from Ireland all the way down to the Azores. But the inshore population is interesting. So the same dolphins that we, we see off um, Dorky in Dublin, we'll see off the west coast, the north coast, um, especially off um, Connemara and more recently off Northern Ireland. The number of bottlenose dolphin sightings coming in around Northern Ireland has grown hugely over the last few years. And it's not, a, not because of increased efforts, it's a real, real issue. But it's interesting, we've never, we've never had a bottlenose dolphin match to the um, east side of the Irish Sea, to the west coast of Wales or the Isle of Man. So um, it'll be interesting to see again, if we share images with Bryony, uh, has she seen any of these dolphins? But um, this is a coastal population, highly mobile and, uh, and very kind of well known. So it's just an, an example of <clears throat> the power of citizen science, the power of recordings, which you send your data to the Irish Well and Dolphin Group, we will share it with other data and add value to it. All this information is available to you online on the website. Uh, if you go to iwd.ie, um, there is four features there uh, and submit stranding. So you can map and browse and have a look around to see what's been seen in your region. Or if you're heading off for the weekend, now we're allowed to travel a small bit, um, go and see has there been any whales or dolphins or basking sharks seen uh, on the coast, um, which gives you the uh, bit more encouragement to look out for yourself to see if you can see these things. We're just about to uh, launch an app as well, a mobile recording app, uh, to make it easier for people to, um, to record this information. That should be launched in the next couple of weeks, just going through final testing. Um, and finally, as uh, Connell said at the beginning, that we have a Dublin uh, local group, which hopefully will meet um, soon once restrictions are um, lifted. So I think that that's that's a wrap from us, Dean. Um, hope we've given people insight into the marine mammals of uh, of Dublin Bay and, and the wider Irish Sea. I hope we've encouraged people to uh, get involved, record and really contribute to um, not only um, experiencing these animals, but also ensuring that we can protect them for future generations. And if anybody has any questions, I know some have come for Q&A, uh, we'll do our best to answer them. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Um, look, first of all, I just want to say thank you so much for your passion. Um, all of you, you know, your passion really emanates, uh, you know, I mean, the beautiful creatures that you're, you're studying, so it's helped. Um, but it's, it's great um, uh, to hear from you and learn from all that knowledge. Uh, I've certainly learned a lot, so thank you so much. Um, so yes, we've got some questions now. I know Eleanor's there uh, looking away. So I don't know, Eleanor, do you, wanna, do you wanna ask the first question? Yeah, sure. Um, I just wanted to shout out as well, Fiona's answered a question for someone who's asking Actually. how they can keep up with her research. So they're actually starting. Do you wanna speak about that, Fiona, just quickly to give a shout out for your podcast starting next week, is it? Yeah, so we're launching a webinar series uh, called Join the Pod, myself and other students in GMIT. So that's going to start on Thursday 6th. So we're quite excited. Um, the first episode started off again and um, invite other speakers. Fantastic. Fantastic. Uh, yeah. um, I've so dropped the, um, the link into the, the chat there for perfect. anyone who wants to link through and register for that. Fantastic. And is that something that you can share with the questionnaire, Eleanor? 
Yes, yeah, I'll add that in. So you'll have um, anyone who's registered will get an email afterwards and we'll put some of the links that have been shared today in that as well. So. Fantastic. Um, and I just want to say that, um, you know, this webinar uh, is has been recorded, it's been recorded. Um, and Eleanor is going to be sharing on the Carry Biosphere website. So um, if, if any of the other webinars uh, of a similar ilk are to go by, there'll be an awful lot more people viewing um, post webinar, which is fantastic. So, um, you know, that, that's great. And, and it'd be great to publish and promote Fiona's uh, webinar there as well. And um, I, I certainly hope to be able to attend there myself. And I can see something being held up. What is this? What is this? Ireland's yes. blah, blah, blah. Go on, Simon, tell us. Belle was being very modest. She didn't actually tell people about her new publication. Uh, she was recently published through the World well Off Group. Ireland's Blubber Bulletin. Blubber Book, sorry. So uh, if anybody, especially the schools, want to get a copy of this, uh, if you write to Shebelle at education at iwg.ie, it's sponsored by Innis and they're sent free with a membership to the group. And if they ask her nicely, um, Shebelle will do a, um, a webinar one-on-one -on -one with schools as well. So um, Ireland's Blubber Book, quality production. Um... Fantastic. Well, that's definitely got to be promoted, Diane Orden. Um, we, we're actually going to be hosting a, a series of um, primary school webinars in the not too distant future. And I'm sure those guys would be interested to find out about, about that. Absolutely. So questions, going back to the questions. Yeah, there's another question here that's actually from um, Jo, who isn't able to get her mic working for us. Um, but she was wondering, is there any joint work and studies that take place between Ireland and the Isle of Man, considering how much we think the cetaceans are moving between the two areas? Um, not formally, really, to be honest. I suppose it's down to kind of um, relationships that, that we have and also the availability of time and, and resources. You know, we would uh, use students quite a lot, certainly at uh, fourth year projects and master's level, because it does take a lot of time and effort to work through, say, photo ID catalogues. Um, so it's more of a casual, informal thing, really. I think that's fair to say, Bryony. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Photo ID is very time consuming. So, yeah. Um... But we do we do try and share pictures with people when we can from around the British Isles. So, but yeah, more more of a casual um, and more informal agreement than a, a structured project. Can remember, there's opportunities going forward between um, the two biospheres to maybe pool our resources and um, yeah. you know uh, see if we can get some better better research maybe um, by working together. That'd be very interesting. I certainly know what, you know when when we do our seal survey there next year. Um, we're hoping there are going to be connections with other biospheres and, um, and from those lessons, we hope to take that on a little bit further. So One of my, one of my early mentors, Dean, uh, Brendan Price, who would be familiar to He's many brilliant, of you. He's brilliant, yes. Yeah, we like Brendan. always say, land divides, sea unites, and it's never been more true. So uh, we will be connected to the Island Man and possibly Landlock Kerry through uh, our marine mammals. So um, we are connected and um, we need to make sure those connections are strong. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now there's a question here for me from Paul. Um, isn't ecotourism an oxymoron? Um, as ICT now equals aviation in carbon sequestering, uh, we can use it instead. Can, uh, COVID has taught us how to wonder more globally. Global, uh, locally? That's a new one for me. Globally. Is that a mix of global and locally? Global and local, for? yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Look, um, I, look, I mean, I, I understand what, what you're coming from with regards to people traveling and the impact on the environment through certainly aviation. Um, but it is possible to have uh, true ecotourism and um, certainly the groups that we work with locally, the adventure tourism operators, um, give you a name, Shane Self Adventures would be one, um, Hidden Hope Experiences, um, uh, kayaking.ie so on and so forth all these guys are offering really good quality experiences for people to get out and experience our biosphere and to learn about our biosphere so i you know i i, I do get where you're coming from but no i think it is possible to have true equal tourism personally Fantastic. I just see Simon is actually typing an answer to this as well, but I might ask you to um, answer it live too. Uh, what are the biggest pressures on marine mammals in the Dublin UNESCO biosphere or, or everywhere really? I suppose they might be quite similar or are there any specific to the Dublin area as well? I might pass it on to Kieran um, because I think uh, yeah. I was going to say disturbance and I think that's certainly true of, of seals probably more than whales and dolphins. Well, certainly from the Bull Island perspective, um, we'd like tighter restrictions on dogs. 
dogs are can you hear me simon yeah yeah, yeah. We, um dogs that are a major disturbance on, on the island and not just to the seal population also to the bird life and um other mammals that are on the island so i can only speak from a kind of a land perspective the biggest disturbance would be the dogs and human encroachment as well yeah kieran but actually um wildlife would have to deal with recreation as well um sporting activities watercrafts i mean there's an increasing number of people engaging in 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 all sorts of water sports at the moment around the island so these are obviously disturbances to seals yeah i mean uh, kieran i mean with regards to north Pole island i know there's um there's a action plan that's uh, out to public consultation um and you know there's talk about um having the island section so that there's areas that um people can't go to um you know to avoid that disturbance so you know who knows that that may happen um we're in the process of creating a video that um highlights the issues of disturbance so we're trying to get that message out through um you know decent communication um but you know, it's, it's being aware and people then uh, following the rules. So that's that's a challenge. But you know, um, you know, we're we're doing we're we're making strides to actively manage these these issues. And um, so away from land, though, Simon. I mean, is there any uh, particular challenges? I mean, I know uh, Kieran there mentioned about the um, water sports. Certainly, we have a huge amount of kite surfers locally. Is there an issue? Yeah, well, you mean on seals or marine mammals generally? I think, I mean, if from a well and dolphin point of view or dolphin and porpoise point of view, there is a lot of pressure now on the East Coast um, with development. Obviously, offshore wind farms is uh, big news. Um, there's plenty on the East Coast, Dublin Array, Kish Bank. Um, we're a bit worried that they're all coming together at the same time. There's no guidance, really good guidance from the government in terms of environmental assessment, environmental impact, mitigation, uh, monitoring. Um, we've just published an offshore wind farm policy document to try and inform the debate so i think uh, we need good planning that's what we need obviously and it's encouraging that the new marine planning bill is is hopefully going through the doyle and um, there's a marine spatial planning element of that so i think it's it's good planning but for, for good planning you need good good information it brings mm -hmm. us back down to data and people contributing you know unless we have an informed um, opinion and uh, on, on where to and when to do things then um, you're just guessing so there's no excuse now in Ireland not to have good data good information to underpin good planning we just need to make it happen um, and I think I personally think that if we had that then um, a lot of the activities that we need and we want and we are an island nation so everything comes in by ships um, uh, which is a big issue in terms of ocean noise if we if we had the information the knowledge then we can we can have both you know I know there's a questionnaire about ecotourism. Ecotourism done properly uh, can enhance conservation by engaging people and uh, making them uh, uh, connect and appreciate um, wildlife at all levels. So it's doing it properly and to do it properly we need data and information and that's what the Well and Dolph group tries to bring to the table is the is the data to inform opinions. And, and, to and, and Conal mentioned about the uh, work that's going on locally with local people how they can actually help contribute to those uh, those data so um, you know we can all uh, get involved and help out there. I mean, obviously you guys do, do, do the majority of the work, but anyone can help out through their citizen science uh, to, to provide the right information. You know, the specific things as well, that's why Fiona's work is so important that um, porpoises, you know, are really, really hard to survey visually. Um, we don't see very much about them. They are quite a peculiar species in some ways because they live, live, live fast and die young. So we have to use the appropriate techniques. So the acoustic, um, uh, uh, techniques that Fiona's using is incredibly powerful um, uh, but it is quite technical you do need clever people like Fiona to be able to mine the data um, but um, we can do it we have the capacity in Ireland to do it we just need to have the will to do it and to want to do it. Fantastic. Fantastic. I, I really love the live fast and die young that I've learned about porpoises today. I didn't know about that before. So <laughs> that's really interesting. Um, and there's a great things. question coming here from uh, Paolo. I might be pronouncing that wrong. So apologies if I am. Um, he's really enjoyed the presentation and he works on uh, par parasites from cetaceans looking at their transport hosts, the fish. Um, so do your groups cooperate with any parasitology group? Stranded specimens for us are an incredible source of data and information that could in turn give also feedback on the marine mammals, health, migration, population and feeding habits. 
Do you have any comments on that? And Paolo is actually an Italian researcher working in Norway. So thank you for joining us today. Wow. For this talk. Um, well, maybe I should take that. We, we do. I mean, the Irish went off who run the stranding scheme. So we're the first to be informed really of a stranded animal. Um, and our role is really to record it. So species, gender, length, and we do take a skin sample for genetics. But above that, it means that there are uh, animals available for more in-depth research, which is beyond the scope of the Welland Dolphin Group. But we would collaborate with third levels and we would collaborate with obviously the museum. We have just run a project for three years with funded by the National Parks and Wildlife Service and the Marine Institute, which is to recover common dolphins, striped dolphins and harbour porpoises for full post-mortem examination at our regional vet labs. And that included establishing a tissue bank so um, there's a, a walk-in freezer in the Marine Institute in Galway full of body parts from whales and dol well, dolphins and porpoises. And the idea is that Paolo can access them, he can apply to the Marine Institute and access um, the different organs. Now some, some research is, is destructive, so you can only do it once, um, but it, it's, uh, it's, the idea, it's the pilot scheme. So hopefully that the government will see the value of this and that we can roll that out because we need to learn, we can learn an awful lot about the life of an animal from a dead animal and working with experts and specialists in the field like Paolo, you know, we can actually get the work done very cheaply uh, by just providing the samples. I personally have a colleague actually in GMIT, uh, Katie O'Dwyer, which pa Paolo might know, um, who's absolutely gets so excited about parasites, it's a bit sad really. Um, but um, we're, we're providing samples for her and she's increasingly getting master students and undergrads to, uh, to start working it up. So I personally secretly find a bit of parasites a bit, Ugh. But um, I love to know people who do like parasites so they can do the work and we can learn from them. So, um, yeah, Paolo, you know, if you have specific research questions that we can help answer, then uh, we'd love to collaborate with you. So uh, thank you very much for that, Simon. Yes. Yeah, so there's an opportunity there for you, Paolo. Um, so we've, uh, we've uh, uh, an observation and a question here from uh, Sean. Uh, so I've had a close encounter with a bottlenose dolphin in Ackle where a small pod starting surfing with, started surfing with me and some friends. This was, of course, an amazing experience, but he wanted to ask, do we know why dolphins tend to voluntarily engage with humans? Is it just curiosity? Is there more going on there? And he'd love to have a recording, a hydrophone recording of the sounds they make when they're surfing with humans. So, <laughs> right. Who wants to take that? Chevelle, do you want to take that one? Yeah, uh, I can do. I suppose. Um, so yeah, bottlenose dolphins, I suppose, are kind of deemed the friendly dolphins. Um, I don't know if that's really accurate, um, but they are definitely curious. And, you know, um, whales and dolphins in general have these massive brains, um, which, you know, does show kind of um, highly intelligent animals. So, and they, they have very um, intricate family connections as well. So they have, um, quite interesting social structures. So maybe they are curious, um, maybe they're having fun. We do see a lot of kind of younger animals um, in particular um, can be quite curious and like to play. Um, but as Simon said, bottlenose dolphins in particular are huge, big lumps of, of blubber. Um, so you'd want to be careful as well that they don't whack into you. Um, what was the other bit of the question? Sorry, if it's it's disappeared from my screen. It was, was uh, the, the, the second part was just, uh, 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 would it be possible to get the, would it be possible to get the recordings um, whilst they're surfing, you know, to the sounds that they might be making? I don't know. Um, that'd be really cool. Yeah, we, we do in certain areas have um, static gear in, in the water. I don't know if we would be able to record um, specifically when there's a surfer in the water as well. You probably wouldn't be able to, to hear that much there'd be a lot of kind of kerfuffle with the water um but we do um, have pods in the water recording bottlenose dolphins off mayo um at the moment as well so they'd be recording uh whistles and clicks and everything and those sounds are actually on our website in the education page so if you'd like to hear them um all the different vocalizations that bottlenose dolphins make you can find that um on the website under the education page so they have whistles, they have clicks, and they have burst sounds, lots of different things um, that Fiona touched on. Uh, I just saw when I opened up the, the Q&A as well, someone asked about fungi. Um, I wasn't going to so mention. I, <laughs> I can answer that. So we haven't um, been able to confirm really anything about fungi. Unfortunately, it's not looking good. It's more than likely that that animal 
um, has died. Um, but of course, without a body, we can't um, confirm. But yeah, uh, the, unfortunately, it's um, it's not looking great for Fungi. It was, um, he was a very old individual, so. Yeah. Um, he had a good and interesting life, I'm sure. So, <laughs> I don't know, is there another question that uh, stands out I, there I, Yeah, sorry, I do have one here. I've been scrolling through the chat as well, and I found one coming from Ruth, and she's, I think, based down near Waterford Harbour in the Hook Peninsula. And she was wondering what kind of species she could expect to see in that area. Would they be the same that you find in Dublin, or is there some different ones showing up? I know Waterford is a, is a great place to be honest um, and you have to remember it's also very seasonal so um, you will have what uh, Bryony called kind of the big five I like that I might I might steal that Bryony if that's okay so things like porpoises common dolphins in the winter in huge numbers um, botanist dolphins are quite quite unusual off, off Waterford to be honest um, uh, minky whales in the summer but in the winter you have uh, humpbacks and fin whales uh, from waterford so the best whale watching in waterford is actually during the winter a nice calm day with the the, the low light you'll pick up a blow of a fin whale from 10 15 kilometers away you can see fin whales while sitting in your car in dunbratton car park so um you know i think the important thing is that Things come and go. Some things are kind of there all the time and some things are quite seasonal. And that's why we have the website. And that's why when people send in sightings data, we first of all validate them. So the sightings data goes through Porakuli, the strandings data goes through Stephanie Levesque. We have to be sure they are what they are. And then we post them up on the website. So if you go to our website, you can be very confident the data is good and robust and is truthful. Um, and um, you can go down and you can map the last year's sightings from County Waterford and see um, when is the best time to see whatever you're interested in. So I think that live kind of feed of, of recent sightings information is, is really important to try and encourage and, um, and improve the probability of somebody seeing these animals for themselves, because there's nothing like seeing them in it yourself. So, you know, Waterford is, is actually much more rich and diverse than Dublin, because it's in the Celtic Sea, which is a very highly productive um, site. Um, but the peak abundance and um, uh, exciting stuff really is in the winter. This is quite a quiet time of year. We're just starting to build now into the season. Uh, so, yeah, you've got everything Dublin has and more. In oh, come on. <laughs> Can't be so. <laughs> Thanks, Simon. I, I've just shared a screen there to, to highlight uh, the, the, the sponsors, um, uh, all the guys that are involved in this uh serious presentations has been really great there is one other question before we before we do head off it it was about um microplastics and are you seeing microplastics when you're doing your autopsies now simon you you're all quiet on us i just uh, i just answered that actually uh, we did actually one of the biggest studies ever of yeah. macroplastics we um looked at over 500 individuals over a 20-year period and 8.5% of all the animals um, we looked at had macroplastics. And that is quite a high rate. But mm -hmm. I, think, I think the rate was high because it was a big study. And every animal we looked at, of the 22, I think we looked at microplastics. Every single one had microplastics in the gut and intestine, which you kind of expect really, Dean. Microplastics are ubiquitous. Yeah. Um, I don't think it takes another study to, to point out that plastics in the ocean is just um, un, 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 un unforgivable and needs mm -hmm. to be resolved. So I think it's important to say that never was plastics the cause of death of the animal. It is rare for micro for plastics to, to lead to the death. You do some, sometimes get them and you hear them in the media of sperm whales starved to death with a, a stomach full of plastics, mm. but that is very rare. So I don't think plastics aren't top of my list of concerns for whales and dolphins, but there's, they're abhorrent and there's no reason why um, they should be in the sea. Um, there's, the, just ask, there's one interesting question, Dean, about um, yep. seals from Kalini. Um, would they be the same seals in Kalini as in uh, a North Bull? So um, I don't know the answer to that. I'm, I'm curious to have a better insight into that. Well, it's quite likely that they are, particularly if they're, if they're grey seals, that they've moved down, they move along the coast, um, between, on the east coast. You know, they, they haul out, obviously, at Lambay Island. Um, Holtz and uh, so it's quite likely that they, there's movement all along the east coast between, between North Dublin and South Dublin. And we do hope to find out for sure. Um, it'll be probably 
uh, 16 or 18 months from now where hopefully we'd have completed our seal survey there next year and we'll have all that information so it's a kind of watch this space to be absolutely certain but i agree with kieran it's highly likely so so guys simon uh, and your team thank you so much it, this has been fascinating uh, I'm sure we've all learned a lot um, and we really appreciate you giving up your time uh, in this manner. Um, and, um, you know, this is this is uh, the fourth in a series, uh, one a month over the next 12 months um, in recognition of the 50th anniversary of the uh, UNESCO Man in Biosphere programme. The next uh, webinar is going to be in Kerry. And Eleanor, maybe you can just tell us a little bit more about what's coming up um, that we can look forward to next year or next month. <laughs> next next year. I've got loads <laughs> of time month. to plan. Uh, no, <laughs> next month we'll be, uh, we'll be joined by Leave No Trace, the McGillicuddy Reeks EIP, and hopefully a few of our local farmers around the Reeks area. And we'll be looking at life in the uplands. So everything from recreation to livelihoods and the kind of habitats that we find there. So it'll be great to see you all there. And that'll probably be sort of the third week of May. I haven't confirmed a date yet, but it'll be out on all our social media channels and websites and shared through the three biospheres once we have that date settled. So hope to see you there. Fantastic. And this and all the other uh, webinars that we're producing um, in partnership together are shared on the Kerry um, YouTube channel. Um, so you get a chance to watch it again, or you can tell your friends if they haven't seen it and you, you thought this was such a wonderful uh, webinar, which obviously it was and is, um, uh, you can tell your friends that they can go and check it out and um, we can they can learn uh, and share in your knowledge. So guys, thank you once again. We're going to head off. We're going to close that webinar here now. Um, and thank you all so much. Thank you again.